the voice, Pastor Q. Thank all you guys for joining us again for our 9 a.m. service here at the Harvest Hour Hotel. Uh, today is our second um, part of the Covenant series, so we thank you guys for joining us. You picked up on last week. If you didn't miss last week, you can go to our YouTube page and find it, or you can go on Facebook. It's there last week for the Covenant series, so we thank all you guys that watched it and was blessed by it. We're going to do the second part today, but before we do that, we're going to have our inspirational reading from Connie, then we'll go to our scripture reading from our sister Lashonda, and then we'll go into the teaching of the word this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. So Connie will come up and do that, and then right now we'll go to uh, the scripture reading. After the scripture reading, we'll have the uh, word of God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Word Movers, those who are here and those online. Keep it together this morning. <laughs> um, I'm going to be reading about the blessing, and the blessing is coming. And it's from Galatians 6, chapter 7 through 10. That's where it's coming from. But it's called, The Blessing is Coming. A friend and I went for a walk with her grandkids. While pushing the stroller, she commented that her steps were being wasted. They weren't being counted on the activity tractor she wore on her wrist because she wasn't swinging her arm. I reminded her that those steps were still helping her physical health. Yeah, she laughed, but I really wanted that electronic gold stock. I understand how she feels. Working towards something without immediate result, results is disheartening. But rewards aren't always immediate or immediately visible. When that's the case, it's easy to feel that the good things we do are useless, even helping a friend or being kind to a stranger. Paul explained to the church in Galatia, however, that a man reaps what he sows. That's in Galatians 6, 7. But we must not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. Doing good isn't the way to gain salvation, and the text doesn't specify whether, that, whether what we reap will be now or in heaven. But we can be assured that we will be a, a harvest of blessing. That there will be a harvest of blessing. Doing good is difficult, especially when we don't see or know what the harvest will be. But as with my friend who still gained the physical benefit from walking, it's worth continuing to do good because the blessing is coming. Amen. And when we are amongst our friends out in the world, I just wanted to say, don't um, stop doing good. Just keep doing good because we that know God and we listen to Pastor Q all the time, we know that a blessing is coming. Yeah. And maybe while we're doing good, we can help others to see our shining light, and they'll want to do good also. All right. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, today's scripture reading is going to come from Joel. And it'll be verse, chapter 2, verses 23 through 26. And it reads, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of rain, the vast shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the, Lord, the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And may people shall never again be put to shame. Amen. 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 Watching over us, we thank you for the message this morning, Father God. Be with me as I teach your message, your word, and your people. Though they um, see me, they may hear you, oh Father God. Give me the ability to preach the unadulterated word of God. Your church, your people may be blessed, oh Father God, and find favor in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So listen, last week we talked about the covenant message, 
And we understand that I was teaching that no, not so much about tithing and offering, but more about an individual being in covenant with God. The covenant with God was I have already set aside what I want to give to God. It's not about a tenth. It's about what I have purposed in my heart. And we all know that when we're dealing with God, God has already set aside in our spirits what we want to give. So last week I was teaching about what happens when an individual is in covenant with God. Now churches always talk about the um, the purpose and reason of tithing, but I want to go into a reason of why you should be in covenant with God. Last week I didn't mention that, and you, a lot of you guys may know that the first covenant that God gave is the rainbow. We didn't know why we have the rainbow, right? It's not. It wasn't first a symbol of pride, but it was first a symbol in um, to to let us know that God would no longer destroy the earth again by water. I did not say He would destroy the earth again. The rainbow was for the saying that he would not destroy the earth again by water. That was the first covenant. The second covenant was the circumcision of the foreskin, yeah. right? We all know about the circumcision, but now, so God told Abraham that the covenant was that on the eighth day, that all the male children should be circumcised, meaning the removal of the foreskin, removal of the foreskin, we're all grown in here, meaning it's the extra skin. When we went into the New Testament, Jesus said that now we're going to be circumcising the heart. Yes. Remember, remember King David says that, Lord created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit Amen. within me. Amen. So listen, you can be circumcised in your flesh all day long, but not be circumcised in your heart. Yeah. God says, I don't want just a circumcised circumcision of the flesh. I want a circumcision of the heart. And the reason why God did that, because more people are able to change their flesh without actually changing their spirit. Yeah. That's why I don't dress up for church because I can look good in front of you guys and really not be good. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. So you can be circumcised, but that don't mean you're good. Yeah. You, your clothes can be clean, but you can be filthy. Yeah. You know, you walk in the restroom, if it smells good, you say the restroom is clean, the restroom could be filthy. Somebody could have just sprayed for breeze in it. Yeah. But you just, you know, you, you, you smell pine saw, you smell bleach. You smell somebody's cologne, somebody's perfume, and immediately you say, mmm, and you want to get to know it by the way it smells. It can destroy your whole life. Right? We've all been suckered in by good perfume and good cologne, right? So God says, listen, I, I no longer want people to have the out, outer together. I want them to actually have the inward together. Because man can make all type of changes to his outer, but inner still be the same. Yeah. That's why he says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothes. Yeah. See, what the wolf found out is, I don't have to actually be a sheep, I just have to be dressed like one. Yeah. I don't have to actually be a Christian, I just have to yeah. dress like one. Yeah. We all have our church clothes, our Friday clothes, and our Saturday clothes. Yeah. Somebody went through something this morning, can't wait to this, where is the church? Well, I can't wait at the work. You know, me, I don't have my closet like that. I can just wear whatever's in my closet. That's just how my life is set up. You, maybe not so. You say it's too short or it's too revealing. I can't put that on. Me, I would probably wear what you say I shouldn't wear that because that's where my life and my God is set up. I'm not trying to present myself in front of people. I'm presenting myself before God. And when you present yourself before God, then That's you right. know that God That's knows right. who you are. So regardless, if you look skanky or skank or whatever they want to say, in your outfit, you know the relationship that you have with your God. And you may not get the best looks. But you know what your relationship is with God. So God says, forget the circumcision of the foreskin and all that. Let's have a man's heart circumcised. Let me deal with your heart, right? Because it's about the heart. The Bible says that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. People tell you who they are all the time. People tell you what's in their spirit if you just listen. Sometimes we choose not to listen. But go to Malachi. So listen, I just wanted to go through those first covenants. So now, the, the third, the, the second part of the covenant that ties into last week's message in Malachi chapter 3. He says in verse 11, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So that he would not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear um, fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. All nations will call you blessed, but you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. God says that 
he will rebuke the devourer for our namesake. As mean as that, when we're in covenant with him, God says that there are there there is something coming to devour what you have, but I'm going to rebuke it. If you understand what rebuke means, rebuke means to send back. I Meaning something was coming for what you have, but since you're in covenant, I'm going to send it back. Notice when they were in the sin in, in, in the sea. And they were in the boat and the wind and the waves. And Jesus, they say he got up out of the ship. He stood up and he says he rebuked the winds and the waves and it was a calm. Rebuke means to what? Send back. But it was coming, right? But they always teach you guys that Jesus really didn't want to rebuke the waves and the wind. He did it to show them who he was. But one of the reasons why he rebuked the waves and the wind is because he couldn't get a peace inside of them. So since he could get, get peace inside of them, he had to create peace. Now, here, here's something I've been teaching all week when I've been taught in Bible study. If God has to create peace for you in your external, you don't really have peace in your internal. <laughs> Meaning that if God has to put you in a place where nobody's talking about you, where no, nothing is going wrong and everything is going okay, that is not saying you have peace. You are in a place of peace. Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, my peace I leave unto you, not as the world giveth. So what God is saying is that you should be able to have peace in the midst of the storm because I've given you a peace that surpasses of all understanding. But you and I pray for a peace that, that removes us from people and removes us from things. So Jesus says, since you don't have my peace, I have to create peace. But an individual is built up in the adversity. And we don't understand that. That's why I tell when we're praying, God, remove me. God, get this person away from me. I just need to go be by myself. God says, you should be able to have peace in the lion's den, peace in the fiery furnace, regardless of where you are. God said, you should be able to have peace. Meaning that what the young people say today is that you should be able to be unbothered. Yeah. Nothing shouldn't bother you that much. I remember mean, once somebody said, you make me mad. That means that I have given you the ability yeah. to make me mad. You should be able to make me mad. That's, that's power I have given up. So he talks about rebuking the devourer means sending it back. A lot of people don't understand that Job was in covenant with God too. And how do I know this? Because when the devil and God were talking, the devil mentioned something. He said that I can't get to Job because he has a hedge of protection around him. <laughs> Meaning that he has thought about getting to Job before, but there's a hedge of protection around him. When you're in covenant with God, and when you're when you're God's people, there's a hedge of protection over your life that the devil just can't do what he wants to do. So when somebody says that the devil is busy, understand that that means he's been given permission and there's two reasons why the devil has been given permission. One of the reasons why the devil has been given permission is because promotion is coming. Because the devil, the devil said to God, he said, listen, I can't get to him because he has a hedge of protection. A hedge of protection is representation of a fence or a God. You know how you go places and see people have a, a tall fence and gate? It's protected. The devil said, I can't get to Job. I can't get to none of this stuff because there's protection in it. He says, but if you move the protection, I'd be able to get there. God says, okay, I will remove the protection and you can touch everything he has. Now, the devil doesn't know, Job doesn't know, that the reason why God is allowing this attack is because God wants to give him double. Can I teach you what's going on in your personal life? So, Job had a fear of losing everything he had, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what if God said, listen, Joe, um, in order for you to get more, you have to give up what you have. Right. Nobody would like that. So guess what God says? God says, Job is not strong enough to let go of what he has. So what I have to do, take it away from him. Yeah. Let me teach you something. I've been in a place, and some of you have been in a place, how many of you have been in a place where God has taken everything away from you. Amen. Amen. You've been in the uh -huh. And listen, he didn't take it to keep it away. He take it so he could give you something more back, double back. But 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 the problem is people say, Pastor Q, why couldn't he leave my old stuff and bring me new stuff? God said, because the two can't mix. You must understand that in the scripture of teaching, that when the son of the promise came and Abraham had Hagar's son. It said the son of the, the 
promise and the son of the bond woman could not dwell together. It created friction. So one of them had to go. Sometimes, you know, your, your wife come in and she becomes head of household and your baby mother and your mother don't like that. We all have dealt with similar yeah. situations yeah. where you became, you know, the wife in somebody's life and he had a mother that didn't like you or had a baby yeah. mother that didn't like you and it was time for them to be shifted and moved out of the way because the new thing has come. Because the old thing and the new thing can't dwell. Right. That's why your ex and your new thing don't get along. They just can't dwell together in unity in certain cases, but it's going to create a few because one has to be pushed out for the other one to be able to dwell. So God says, listen, I can't um, allow Job's new things and his old things to dwell together. I can't put new wine in the old wineskins. So he says, Job doesn't have enough faith in me to let go of his stuff, so I have to take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now listen, this is what God is showing me. Now, when he allows your things to be taken, he has all the purpose of giving it back, but you and I don't know how to let things go. Yeah. When God is you know what, you know what God will do? He'll allow you to lose your job. Yeah. He'll allow certain things to happen when he's, but it doesn't happen right away. A lot of us have been gone, been going years in this season where God is stripping things away from us, but he's only doing that to restore them. But first and foremost, the things that have to happen before, not just he removes all the old things, he has to remove the people too. Yeah. Right? That's going to cause the new things to be toxic. Because some things, I'm not saying people are bad, but God has to remove things. And sometimes when God removes your finances and the benefits that you do for people, the people will leave too. Yeah. 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 Amen. So God doesn't have to move my friends. He just has to move my stuff and my friends will go. Yeah. Because people are connected to me for the things I have and the things I can do for them. So the day I could not loan you money, that's going to end our friendship because you feel like I have it. The day I can't take you to the store, you're going to feel some type of way and that's going to break that friendship. The day I say I don't want to do what we used to do, you're going to think I'm better. That's going to end that friendship. Oh, God is ending friendships. Based off of ceasing me being able to do beneficial yeah. things for them. Amen. He's ending friendships. Good he God. took my car. Yes. Took my house. Yeah. Took things away from me yeah. that people were using me for. Yeah. And when I couldn't do those things anymore, the people left too. Yeah. I didn't answer my phone one time. Yeah. You found somebody else to call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God says, let me remove the things. That's going to cause my new thing to come in. Yeah. Now God says, no, the, 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 the people who are there now will not no longer be able to eat sure. off of the new stuff I'm bringing out. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Glory so God Lord. says, listen, he, he has great teaching too, right? Do you know anything about the book of Job that when Job hit rock bottom, yeah. he found out who his friends were. Yes, he did. Yeah. 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 His friends came over, they were like, Job, uh, you must have done something for all this stuff to be happening. <laughs> Can I teach you that when God is getting ready to promote you, bad things will happen, and it has nothing to do with you doing anything wrong. But it'll look like it, though. Because you got one of the most spiritual friends and grandma that said, you mess with somebody's husband, or you've been doing something wrong, and this is the wrath of God. Listen, when bad things happen to good people, it doesn't always mean that you've done something wrong. It means that God is setting you up and he's removing all the old stuff. God has to remove the old stuff before the new stuff comes in. He's cleansing. He's doing the cleaning. He's making sure, listen, the house is clean and swept. He, he, he removes all those things so he can set you up. Because Job didn't know, the devil didn't know. Yeah. That God was setting them up for double. Yeah. So Job found out who his friends were. They questioned Job. They said, Job, you must have done something because all these things are happening to you. You must have done something. Job said, I didn't do that. I've been faithful yeah. to God. I didn't do anything. He said, you must have done something. So he found out who he was. And everybody knows the scripture at the end of Job 42 where it said that Job got everything back when he prayed for his friends. You know that? But at first, these wasn't the best friends because they didn't know how to be Job's friend in this yeah. season. Yeah. See, certain people know how to be your friend in certain seasons. 
in, in, in your reaping season, not your sowing season, right? I've had friends that know how to be around in my reaping season, but when I'm trying to sow something and tell them where I'm trying to go with something, don't nobody know how to believe, but everybody's around for my reaping season. My reaping season when things is coming in, but when I'm sowing, trying to start something, I, can't hate, I hate when I'm trying to stop something and somebody tell me how somebody else didn't feel that. People won't look like you to start nothing. That's when you see where people are. When you're trying to start something. So God says he takes all Job's stuff just so he can give it to him back. But this is all God's plan that he may give the devil, he may give Job a promotion. All things have to be stripped away. So he allowed the devil to touch the stuff. I had, when Shonda read the scripture in the, uh, I think it was the book of Joel this morning. I want you to see what uh, what Joel has said this morning. What the scripture was in the book of Joel. Joel, Joel, J-O-E-L. Look what Joel says. So, let me read the first part. For he has given you the form of rain faithfully. That's 23. He will cause the rain to come down for you. Notice this. I always teach that you can't sow a seed and then expect it not to rain. Mm -hmm. But God is talking about physical rain. There has been no rain. There has been a drought. They've been sowing seed, but what, there's no rain. But God says, I'm going to allow the rain to be able to come because you know that nothing grows without the rain. So you'll learn to appreciate your rainy days. Your rainy days, I'm not talking about gray, sky, gray, uh, gray clouds out skies and uh, precipitation coming down from the cloud. I'm talking about rainy days where you are being tried. He says, the threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vest shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. Now listen, when God says restore, he's saying because a lot of us was not in covenant with him. But listen what he'll say when he says I'm restored, means restore means what? I'm going to be able to give back. Christians believe when their stuff has been taken that the devil has taken their things. And that's not true. Because, you know, if you belong to God, that the devil needs permission before he takes anything. Listen to what God says in verse 25. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. Hold on. God sent something to eat up my stuff? The loving God? And the whole time, I'm blaming the devil? Guess what God says? You don't have any insurance. You don't have any coverage. Yeah. Why don't I have any coverage? I'm not in covenant. Mm -hmm. God says, listen, I purposely send these locusts out to destroy. And when you don't, when you're not in covenant with me, they touch your stuff. Because you're not in covenant. And it's not just financially, it's about being in a relationship as well, too. But God says, know what? Yeah, you can you can be my child, you can be saved and all that. But when I send out the locusts, they will touch your stuff if you're not in covenant with me. So you need insurance in the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. You need something like, your, you know, the thing about more than I see on TV right now is auto insurance. State Farm, Nationwide, Geico, Liberty, uh, you know, the general. Notice you see all of these insurance companies, right? And what they're trying to sell you is what? Coverage. If something was to happen. So God has sold us coverage. The first coverage, priest of funeral yesterday, that God talks about is the coverage that if you were to die, you know where you're going. So the first coverage he gave you was Christ. And I'm going to get into that with the Old Testament. The first coverage I have is receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if I die, he has gone to prepare a place for me that where he is, I may be also. That's the first coverage. The coverage saying that... Um, the coverage of God does not mean that God stops me from dying. It represents that if I do die, I have a place to go if I do die. That's insurance already set in place. Yeah. The second coverage, and God is saying, is that if something was to happen to your stuff, I'm going to what? Replace it or fix it because you're in coverage with me. People say, well, um, why didn't God allow it to be passed over? Let me teach you something. That's a great teaching God showed me the other day. 
How many people do you know were in an accident, right? And got a settlement, a settlement. Mm -hmm. And the settlement changed their entire life. Somebody's living good right now because of a settlement that started from an accident. Mm -hmm. You know how many people on a daily basis get in car accidents, slip, fall, mm -hmm. things like that, bad things happen, and get a large lump mm -hmm. sum of money? <coughs> I'm not saying that we want to go out here and get an act. I'm just trying to teach you that a lot of times God says, listen, the whole time you had this accident, it wasn't meant to be an accident. I was setting you up to be blessed yeah, amen. because of the settlement you was going to get. Yeah. Wow. Now, listen, nobody would say, would you say, God, if he showed you you had to go through an accident, go through a slip and fall, go through what you have to go through to get that settlement? You say, you know what? I don't want it. God says, listen, I'm going to allow this bad thing to be a good thing for you. Like, Joe, like Joseph uh, told his brother, he said, the thing that you meant for bad, God had meant for good. Yeah. So we know the story. God showed him all the visions and all where he was going to be and his brothers bowing down to him. But God did not show him all the bad things that was going to happen to him. He didn't show that he was going to be thrown in the pit, uh, sold into slavery, worked into Potiphar, uh, falsely accused of rape, being back in prison. But God showed him where he was going to end up. And God doesn't show us the bad things that's going to happen. He shows us the end. Have you ever caught the end of a movie? And went back and watched the beginning yes. and started it over but you already knew how it was going to end so you were already confident you are, you, you're watching it saying I know how this is going to end I already know how it ends I'm going to go back and see how it started so why does God show me the end from the beginning he wants me to know that regardless of what's happening right now I'm going to win wow yes I'm going to show you the end. God, why are you showing me all these dreams about um, I'm in a good place and where are you going to bless me? Where are you going to take me? But your vision, to, your vision tomorrow doesn't match my finances or my um, situation right now. Has God ever showed you something in your dreams and showed you in a great place and you wake up and you say, wow. And then you go look at your checking account and you say, I don't know how that's going to happen. <laughs> I don't have, there's no evidence. Oh, yes. <laughs> Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God will show you something, but you don't have the physical evidence in the present. Because God shows you a vision. That's why the Bible tells you in the book of Habakkuk, he says, listen, write the vision, make it plain. And he says, though it tarry, waits for it. And the end it shall speak. God says, I showed you the vision to be able to keep you encouraged. Because you look at things right now and you say, you know what? All these things are happening bad, but I still have his vision of how it's going to turn out. God says, I showed you that to be able to keep you in care. Yeah. So you don't think that I have given up on you. I'm showing you how it ends. Even though things are bad for you right now, I'm showing you how it turns out. I mean, how it ends for you. So listen, God is all about restoring the things he sent to destroy, but he says in Malachi, I will rebuke the devourer for your namesakes, for my name's sake. God says there are things that I will send, and here's the thing, before I got into covenant with God or relationship with God, it seems like we couldn't save. Every time something, I got a few dollars over the bankroll, something will come and eat that up. Yes, yes. Anybody living like that? Every time I get a little extra, yeah. something come and eat that up. Yes. As soon as I try to save, something wrong with your house, Something wrong with the car. Yes. Just always something. Yes. Yes. A lot of times that represents me not being in covenant with God. He sent out the locusts. And the locusts are eating up all my stuff. God said if you was in covenant with me. I would have rebuked those things from happening. But let me tell you something. Because there's a flip side of that message too. I don't want you to misunderstand. I don't want you to think that sometimes. Every time something bad happens. It does not mean you're not in covenant. Because I've seen the blessing in something. Sometimes, I don't, I, I always ask myself this when I have to pay out money for something. What's worse, having an issue and not having the money for it, or having, you know, you know what I said, having an issue and not having the money for it, or having a problem and having the money to be able to fix it? Exactly. Yeah. Because sometimes things go wrong, but God has provided. Yes. 
I don't like being in a situation where there's a problem. I don't have the money to fix it. But I also hate being able to take the money that I have to fix it because I was probably saving it for something else. You know, the thing about it is, is that I was teaching on this the other day in the covenant that God had made a covenant with Pharaoh and he didn't even know it. And it was revealed through Joseph because do you remember the story where um, Joseph had uh, told Pharaoh, he says that the dreams that he were having about the seven good, um, uh, I think it was seven good cows and a bad good cows and the seven good grain of corn and seven bad grain of corn. Pharaoh had a dream twice and he dreamt both of those things that the uh, the good cows ate the bad cows and basically so many words and the good grain of corn was uh, swallowed up by the bad grain of corn and he said what God was teaching him when Joseph uh, gave him um, understanding of the dream he said that it meant that they were going to have seven years of good and plenty and then they were going to have seven years of famine right so what God was saying is that what I will do is give you the money for the famine, or not so much the money, the grain, for the famine up front. Right? Double. So then, when the seven years of famine comes, you have already had seven years of good and plenty to be able to match. So you have it already stored up. Right? I've seen God for a season, and you have seen this happen, bless you with an overflow. Yeah. Okay? But I, I, I did something wrong with the overflow. I spent the overflow because I didn't pray about the overflow. The overflow was for a season that was getting ready to come up. But I'm not in tune enough. A lot of times we're not in tune enough with God because I tell you what, the malls were crowded yesterday because people got their taxes back. And there were more people in the malls than usual because people got their taxes back, right? And nobody is saving as they say for a rainy day because they hit all at once and they flew to the mall, not knowing that the brakes going you're gonna need brakes next week. <laughs> and the AC unit is gonna go out. Certain things are gonna happen. So when you have spent it all, you're gonna be like the prodigal son, and you're like, man, what happened? Um, I need to put now I gotta get this fixed. But is it safe to say that? God had already given you something previously for the ill that was going to happen in the future. But you thought every time, listen, every time you get blessed for something because you're in the kingdom of God, don't think that God's just giving you extra to spend on you. Sometimes God is giving you something for something that is coming. Sometimes I'm wearing my brick money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, your head, three, four hundred dollars, you're wearing your bill money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, sometimes it just gotta be, you know, women gotta be a wig week, you know, right? Mm -hmm. It gotta be a hat week. <laughs> but when God blesses, he don't tell me what's coming, he gives it, so when it does come, I already have it. But I got it. And, and that was the problem with the prodigal son. He got his inheritance and he went out there and blew it all on riotous living because he got his inheritance, but he didn't have any wisdom with it. That's why the, that's why the Bible teaches you and I that to uh, ask God for wisdom. Wisdom is knowing what to do with what he gives me. That's why when King Solomon prayed, King Solomon didn't ask for stuff. He asked for wisdom, and when he got wisdom, God gave him the stuff. Yeah. Sometimes God is withholding the stuff is because you don't have wisdom. Wisdom meaning knowing what to do. Listen, I very seldom, like you pray, when I get a large sum of money, God, what you want me to do with this? Yeah. Yeah. I already know what I want to do with it when I first get it. Matter of fact, I have plans for that tax money right now, like you and I. <laughs> what if God told you? Listen, great teacher, right? God has not told me and I'm going to be honest, to tell anybody to sow their income tax to the church. He hasn't said a word like that. But churches are preaching that. You're getting your refund coming. Don't forget about God. Listen, take your refund and do something with it for the kingdom of God. Do something for somebody. You know somebody who's struggling. Go help them out. Yeah. 
Don't bring your money just to the church. Help out one of your friends. Get, be a blessing to somebody else. Do that. He didn't say bring your bring your refund check to the to the altar. Let me teach you that real quick, because somebody need to hear this. Now, the the priest and the publican both got their taxes back. I'm gonna twist the story a little bit. The priest and the publican both got their taxes back and walked by the man who had been stripped and robbed of everything. Remember the Bible, the priest and the publican, no, the priest and the uh, and the, the Pharisee, was it? Priest and the um, yeah, it's gonna come to me. Two, I think it was the priest and the Pharisee uh, walked by. Wasn't the first. It was gonna kill me to say. No, yeah, but they walked by the good, they walked by the man who had been stripped of everything, right? That's gonna to come to me. Two, basically, two religious men in so many words. Walk by this man who had been stripped from everything, and they walked right past him because the scripture teaches that they were on their way to church. Yeah. Right? So their ministry was laying on the side of the road, but because they were on their way to church, they walked right by their ministry. So it took a good Samaritan who was not in the best space and place with God to come and help the man, but the priest and the Levite, not the Samaritan, thank you. The priest and the Levite both walked right by the man who had everything stripped away from him and walked by him and probably went to church. But it took a Samaritan who did not know God to stop and help. And Jesus talked about that. He said that he, he loved what the good Samaritan had done, but he was upset with the priest and the Levite. More so like church people, right? Sometimes we're trying to do, can't wait to get to church, walk right past issues that's in our lives that we can help with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And run the money right to the church and walked it by people who really needed it. Yes, yes. Now listen, I don't want to serve a God that says he wanted my tithe of $50 more than me giving that $50 for somebody for groceries. I, don't, I can't serve a God like that. That, I, that my, my tithe in church was more important than I knew somebody that needed the $50. And sometimes we can get slick. Don't get slick and start lying. Like, well, you know what? I ain't tired because I've been out helping people. Well, God knows. You know, people put it all the time. Now, people be in church saying that I don't tie because I do stuff in my community. I help people. If that's what you do, then fine. And if that's what you do, then God shall reward you for that. Because some of you guys do that. You, you got people that you loan money to when you're helping people out. And that's fine, too. But still, you want to be in covenant with God. Because what will happen is, if you're more in covenant with helping people and not in covenant with God, God will cut off of your flow so you can't even help nobody nor yourself. Because I've seen a season where people that were helping people got to a place they couldn't help anymore. And I'm going to tell you why God does that. Because sometimes when you're helping people, the people that you're helping help start putting you on a pedestal like you're God. So God says, I have to stop you from being able to give because people are looking to you as they should be looking to me. So now I got to cut you off from being able to give anything because you got too many people. Sometimes you have people in your lives who are way too dependent upon you. That's why God cuts that off. And that day I say no, I told the guy the other day tomorrow, yesterday, he said, Uncle, oh, man, let me get $20. I said, the worst thing I do is to start giving you money. He said, what do you mean? I said, because it makes you lazy when you look for somebody to give you something. The day somebody told me no, I was on my ground. That's how you got on your ground, the day somebody told you no. But if you know that somebody's going to continue to give, you will continue to sit back and do nothing. That's right. That's right. You want to help somebody grow? Tell them no. But use wisdom, though, because I don't want you to walk in and tell everybody no. <laughs> Pastor, you said tell you no. I'm gonna grow, you're going to grow. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is that help people help themselves because yeah. they're way too dependent upon you to help them. Yeah. Oh, nice. 
Sometimes, you know, as a Christian, I guess because our hearts are good in God, that, that we have this thing on our minds that if we don't help people, they're just going to jump off the ends of the earth. Does your spirit manipulate you like that? I don't help, you know. Some of us have got so good hearts that we think if we don't help, we don't want to feel bad. If people will send you a tell, okay, yes, I'll be stripping again. Yes, you will be stripping again. <laughs> New Jordans came out yesterday. Mama, you don't buy them. I guess I gotta do what I gotta do to get them. <laughs> guess you gotta do what you gotta do. Because your kids will manipulate you. People manipulate, oh, okay. So you ain't got the four. Don't worry about it. You know your girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. I got I get it. And to me, when she says that, that means she's getting it from somebody else. Yeah. How much you need? Don't worry about it, I get it. <laughs> you feel how that resonates with you. You let people say, okay. You got kids? You can't give me a joy? Nope. Well, I guess I got to do what I got to do. All right, I'll be writing you and sending the money for the joy that's there. Can't let people manipulate you because God will cut your things so that you're not able to help people anymore so that they're able to grow. Yeah, amen. A bit more time. Look what he says. I will restore the years of the swarming locusts I've eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army which I have sent among you the whole time. This is God doing all of this. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. I'll close on this. So listen, Exodus chapter 12, I believe. Some of you guys remember the story in Exodus where um, in the book of Exodus, uh, Genesis, I think it's Genesis and Exodus, right? This story in the Bible where, uh, I think I was just talking about it, where God says that he was going to send the, uh, what, did, what did God call it? That he was going to pass through Egypt, and if the houses didn't have the blood on the doorpost, this is what God says on, in, in Exodus chapter 12, I'll read it for you. He says, speak on the congregation, Exodus 12 verse 3, on the 10th of this month, every man should take for himself a lamb, According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Now, everybody understands that when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is where Old Testament and New Testament runs together because in the Old Testament, he was asking for a lamb. And when John saw Jesus, he says, here comes the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So you see the Lamb in the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament. Then you see the Lamb in the Old Testament, right? You see the lamb in both places. But one is an animal and one is a person being called a lamb. But we understand that they were using the lambs at one time as a sacrifice, as God has given us his son as a type of lamb for a sacrifice. That's why when you understand the Old Testament, when Jesus says, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, he wasn't saying of his body. He was saying because he was the word of God and he was the lamb. And this is what God was teaching them to do with the lamb. Not only were they able to just, not only were they able, were they supposed to just slaughter the lamb and use his blood, they were supposed to cook the lamb and also eat the lamb also. It represents of uh, uh, drinking the blood, which is the blood represents the wine. You don't want to sound gruesome, right? And the lamb, the body of the lamb represents the, um, the body of Jesus. And we know that the body of Jesus is the word of God. How do we derive it that? We derive it that from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and it dwelt among us. So when he says eat the Word, he's saying eat his body. That's what we do. We're fat. We eat the Word of God. Verse 5 of Exodus chapter 12 is going to the teaching here. Your lamb shall be without blemish. When it says without blemish in the New Testament, it's talking about without sin. We know that Jesus was without sin. But a lamb without blemish in the Old Testament is a lamb that doesn't have any spots. He says, I want you to choose a lamb that doesn't have any spots, and you may take it from the sheep from your to sheep of your goats. Now listen, he says this, right? He wanted it to be the first. Notice this. Jesus wants them to sacrifice. I mean, the word is telling him in the Old, in the Old Testament to pick out the first. But well, listen to what God says, right? In verse 12 of uh, Exodus 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against 
all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The God is asking for your first, saying that I want your first or I'm going to come through and take your first. Look at he's talking relationship now. He says, I want your best, your first, without blemish, the best you have in exchange. So when I come through, if you don't have, if, if, if I haven't received your first and I don't see it, the blood of it on the doorpost, because it couldn't be any blood. It had to be the blood of a particular lamb, one without spot, without blemish, doing it's a, it's a type of Christ. And he says, when I come through and if I see the blood of the lamb, he says, I'm going to pass over. But if not, I'm going to take your first from you. Now, why is God all about the first? Everybody remembers the first thing they had, first car, first this, mm -hmm. first person they've been with, first stuff. But God's because your first is always the thing that's dearest to your what? Heart. Amen. So God says, either give me your first or I take what's first. The first basically represents the thing that's most important to you. The thing that you hold dear. A lot of times it's your firstborn. It represents the relationship. Parents will tell you it's something about their firstborn. It's the relationship of it. But what God is teaching right here, he's basically saying that I'm going to attack or destroy anything that you put above me. For I am a jealous God. Yeah, yeah. That's why he go back to Matthew 6 and 33 and he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, meaning that God is always wants to be put first. He doesn't want to be second to anything. And whatever I put before him is, the, is always the thing that he's coming after. And a lot of times the thing that is first is the thing that I care about the most. You show me a person who's going through something and I'll tell you a person and I'll show you, you show me what they're going through, I'll show you what they care about. Show me what a person is going through, I'll show you what they care about. God has a way of getting your attention is that when, and all you guys have kids and things in who love their kids as you should, soon as you're, if God knows that your life is getting off track, you know where the attack comes? On your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Why the kids? Because you'll stop everything for your kids. Yeah. You'll start praying for your kids. Your kids, that's going to be the first attack. He said, I'm going to attack your firstborn. I'm going to allow things to start happening with your kids. And, and a lot of times, your kids will bring you to the altar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Slam. Mm -hmm. Real fast. I, I don't know what it is, but fathers don't pray for their sons like mothers do. Mm -hmm. Mothers always call me, Pastor Q, I need you to pray for my son. He out there in the street. He going crazy doing this, that. Fathers don't do that. They may pray to, you know, talk to him. Mothers go to God about their kids, about their boys. About their daughters. She fast now. She's smoking. She's drinking. Basically, she's just doing what you used to do. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Right? right? When you were young. Sometimes God doesn't correct your behavior because he was going to give your behavior back to you through your own kids. Come on. Amen. So when you get to praying that God fix them, He's saying now you have your obedience in your face. Deal with it. Because guess what God is saying? As I'm allowing your child to run out of control, these are the consequences for what you have done. God says this is not a game I'm playing with you, but I want to show you mine and your relationship through your kids. Yeah. I want you to love them like I loved you. I don't understand. Yeah, God says, your kids are you. You birthed that. Now you have you back in your own lap, back in your own hand. Yeah. Deal with it. Yeah. But guess what God says? The thing you got away with, I allowed you to birth. And the thing that you birth is going to bring you back to me. Because once you have your own problem in your hand, it's going to bring you back to me. Yeah. Because Amen. I'm going to allow your kids to be uncontrollable. Yeah. And you're going to have to come to me because you're not going to be able to deal with it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. The kids are in control. Look at the youth right now. Yeah. That's they are us. Yeah. But what we've done, we've gave up on them. Lock our doors when they come, run from them. You run it from yourself. That's you. <laughs> you are running from they they're worse than us. No, it's not that they're worse than us. They just have cameras now to show us what they're doing. You didn't have cameras in your day. Nobody was recording you fighting at school and having sex and smoking in your room. You were doing the same thing. Young people not doing nothing different than what we were doing. They just have a camera now to show you stuff. Listen, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. If you think stuff is new right now, you're crazy. The stuff been going on. Yeah, we can see it now. We can see it now. That's why, I mean, the stuff, what are young people doing now that you wasn't doing? Yeah. You just didn't have nothing to be, you didn't have a phone that can record it. That's all. And that's that's good for your sake because you did some of the same things. But listen, getting back to the message, right? God says that I, I put that back in your face. The attack comes on the kids, not in a bad way, but since God knows that you love your kids, when the attack comes that way, it'll cause you to get in line. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Can I teach you that sometimes the fix and answer to your kids is you getting back in God's face? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's what we're here comes the hypocrisy, right? We want to raise our kids godly, but don't Come want to on. be godly around the house. Come on. Talk about this on my show. Can't keep bringing uncles in the house and expect him to have good grades in school. Yes. Yeah. You can't show one thing and then want to take them to Sunday school and then you do something different at home. That's right. That's yeah. right. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes he's acting up because he wants your attention. And sometimes God is allowed them to act enough because God wants your attention. Look at all the attention that's needed. The kid needs my attention, and he's acting up because what? God wants my attention. Everybody, it's a circle or a cycle of attention. God don't have my attention, so he's allowing you to act up because you want attention. Now, I keep going to school because you're in detention. That's my little back right there. I just made that up. That's pretty good, brother. Yes, 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 well, what would it be behind that? <laughs> well, listen, we're talk. Now you got to take off. Now you're upset. I buy him everything. I do everything. Put a roof over his head. He acting like this and that. His father ain't around this, this and that. You got to get lined back up, mom. Yeah. You can't keep putting him in front of the TV and then and running the go-go. And come back. <laughs> You're leaving him to be raised by the TV. Yeah. Let me say this, right? A bit, there has been a big thing on um, social media about Dwayne Wade, right? Yes. And we all know about the situation with Dwayne Wade, right? Yeah. And, and the thing about it, Dwayne Wade said his, his kid came to him and told him that he no longer wanted to be called him, he wanted to be called her. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But let me say this. If that's what he wants to do, that's what he wants to do. But let me say, what I always want people to know, that information came from somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It came from somewhere. Yeah. And, and what, what I say that to say this. I'm not saying that he could have changed him from being gay. What I'm trying to say is that a lot of times we set our kids in front of TVs. Yeah. And we don't know what they're watching. That's right. We don't know what's going on in their minds. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the thing about it is, the only thing he can do now as a father is love him through it. But here's something I want to teach you that happened with the situation with Dwayne Wade. Now that Dwayne Wade's son wants to no longer be a man, he wants to transform, become transgender, and be a woman, guess what it has caused? It has caused Dwayne Wade as a father to now be what? More involved in his child's life, less in basketball. Yeah. 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 What did his son want? Yeah. Not only, I'm not denying he wants to be a woman. I'm saying that he wants the attention of his father and his family. And sometimes as people, we do what we want to do to get the attention from others. Yeah. Amen. I'm not saying he doesn't want to. I'm not saying that he doesn't um, want to be a woman. I'm saying now that it has caused Dwayne and Gabrielle and everybody else to what come more involved. Yeah. 
just like the man from America's Most Wanted. He didn't care nothing about people shooting and killing and being abducted until somebody abducted his kid. Right? So guess what? Life introduces me to something that's going to require my involvement. Man, my sister tell you, we didn't care nothing about breast cancer until our grandmother had it. My sister was an advocate for it, marching for breast cancer, all this stuff for our grandma. But before our grandma had cancer, we wasn't marching. Nobody didn't care about cancer in your family until Big Mama had it. That's right. That's right. Now you're marching, wearing pink, wearing white. You didn't do that until it came. But guess what? That made you want to be what? More involved. Your brother, your father, or your son went to prison. Now you're against mandatory minimums. The laws are strict. See how when it hits your household, how it causes you to want to be involved? Yeah. Take something bad to happen. Society. Society will draw you in. So, you know, going back to that, and after the very close of the message here. Well, so, when God is saying that he, will, he, he required their first, or he would destroy their first, but God says he wanted a relationship where you wasn't afraid or have fear or didn't want to sacrifice or give up something that meant something to you. But God says, I'm, I'm only doing that because on the back end, I'm going to protect you from there's a devour word that's coming. Let me show you something God showed me. This will bring a praise out of you, right? Before we close is that God says, a lot of times you're ungrateful because you don't know what I allow not to happen. Yeah. He says, you, you, don't, you don't know what I allow not to happen. God says, because of the covering, let me talk, let me, let me teach you something real quick because of the covering. You ever be in a circle of people and certain things happen to everybody else, but it don't happen to you? Yes. It yes. represents the covering over your life because Thank of the you covenant. Thank you, Lord. Thank and you didn't did, listen, we didn't did the same thing that everybody else was doing, and somehow we come out yes. that squeaky yes. clean. Yes. Yes. Come on. Amen. Amen. It's the covenant. That you have over your life. We didn't need the same thing. Oh, come on. You see people you went to school with and you they don't look like they graduated with you. Our 45s looks different. Our 50s look different. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm kept. Yes. Yes. Amen. We don't look like we graduated together because I'm kept. Sometimes you have more than me, but I'm kept better. I'm telling you, man. That's the glory of God. Come out of something looking younger. My money might not be all that, but I'm kept. Like you looked at high school, I'm kept. It ain't that my memory bad, you just don't look like you looked in high school. You haven't been kept. I've been kept. Man, he hasn't allowed the things that has hit you to hit me that way. They hit me, they bounce off differently. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your time. We thank you for the second part of the covenant message today. Thank you for bringing us through it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get a little hand. Praise.